Hi, everyone, and thank you for being with us today. We're going to give folks a bit of time to get into the Zoom room, but in the meantime, I'm hoping we can use the chat box to check in. Um, so we've opened up the chat. Anyone can chat. Please put in your name, your pronouns, where you're joining us from, uh, even who you're representing here today. Um, so just type that in the chat box. I know we had some international folks register, so I'm especially excited to see where folks are joining us from. All right, so we'll give everyone like probably 30 seconds to use the chat and then like get into the room just because I think there was a Zoom update yesterday. Um, and I know it took me a few more minutes than normal to get into Zoom. Awesome, we've already got Ann Arbor, Ottawa, Massachusetts. This is great. Well, full disclosure, we're all here in Minnesota. Um, so I won't make our panelists chatting. You'll hear from them pretty soon here. Well, with that, I think I'm going to get us started. We have a lot to talk about today. So thank you for joining us for our Get the Buzz webinar and happy soon to be World B Day on Friday for all who celebrate. My name is Joe Olson. I'm the Senior Director of Communications and Engagement at Fresh Energy, and I am so grateful to have so many people joining us today. And for those of you not familiar with Fresh Energy, we are a clean energy policy nonprofit in Minnesota that for three decades has helped Minnesota and the Midwest and everyone who lives here end dependence on fossil fuel, electrify their lives, and build a healthy, clean energy economy where all can thrive. And part of that work is pollinator friendly solar, which is why we are here today. So as you can see, we have a lot to talk about. We'll be taking a deep dive into the recent study from Monarch Joint Venture, followed by a discussion about pollinator friendly solar movement here in the US, and then a 101 on seed mixes and successful projects. And then we will wrap up with about 15 minutes or so dedicated to a live Q&A. So about that Q&A, a little bit of housekeeping. So even though the Q&A is at the end of the webinar, you can submit your questions at any time. We'll be using the Q&A function for those questions instead of the chat box. Um, so please, you'll find a little button at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A, um, use that one, type your questions in there. And then the cool thing is if you like someone else's question, you can give it a thumbs up and it will upvote the question and send it to the top of the list. Um, so this webinar is being recorded, and we will email you a link to the recording later this afternoon or early tomorrow. Now, on to the main event. Welcome to our presenters and speakers. I'm joined today by Laura Lukens, National Monitoring, Monitoring Coordinator at Monarch Joint Venture, Rob Davis, Communications Lead at Connexus Energy, and Jake Jansky, Director of Field Service Operation and a Senior Ecologist at Minnesota Native Landscapes. Welcome. All right, Laura, I think you have the controls and I'm going to stop sharing my screen and you can take it away. All righty. Thanks, Joe. Um, I will just see here. Try this. You have to let me know in one moment if this works. Will do. All right, we see your screen. And How is that? Is Perfect. Yep. Great. Good to go. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I'm Laura Lukens, and I work for the Monarch Joint Venture. And as Joe described, I'm here to talk briefly about a um, pilot study that we conducted on um, Minnesota solar farms this last year in the summer of 2021. Um, so as I mentioned, I work for the Monarch Joint Venture, and um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, we work to conserve monarchs and their migration across the United States. Um, since 2009, we've been bringing together partners from across the US, which includes federal and state agencies, other nonprofits, um, community groups, academic programs, and others that um, work with us to implement science-based conservation actions. We work in a joint venture model, which as I just described, is comprised of many cooperative partnerships. Um, and we've created a monarch conservation implementation plan, which um, identifies and prioritizes conservation actions. And each section of the plan are um, organized by the four pillars of our work. And that includes partnership, education and outreach, 
habitat conservation and science. Um, we have dedicated staff working in each of these program areas to serve our partners and advance the plan priorities. And we update this plan um, about annually from time to time with input from our partnership. So as you might have heard, um, the monarch population has been declining over the last decade or two. Um, this slide here is representing the eastern mo monarch population, so um, monarchs that breed and reproduce east of the Rocky Mountains and those that overwinter in central Mexico. Um, Western monarchs breed west of the Rocky Mountains and overwinter on the coast of California. The California or Western monarch population is a bit smaller, so we measure it a bit differently. Um, and I'll discuss that on the next slide or so. But here, um, looking at the Eastern monarch population, we have the area occupied by monarchs in Mexico on the Y axis. So rather than counting each individual monarch, which is really impossible, there are millions and millions of them in Mexico, um, folks go out and measure the area that they occupied. And one hectare is about the size of a uh, football field. Um, and so you can see here that um, the average population size of monarchs in the you know, early 90s um, to the early 2000s was about double of what it's been in the last decade or so. And scientists have estimated that this is roughly a 70% decline over the, you know, compared to what the population was in the early 90s. Um, this here pictured is the population of Western monarchs. So the green bars represent the total number of monarchs that are counted in the overwintering groves in California, while the blue line represents the number of sites that are monitored. So although the number of sites monitored has been increasing, the number of monarchs counted has been decreasing. Um, you can see that in the 1990s, the population was well over a million monarchs, and in 2018 and 2019, there was quite a severe crash in the population. Um, fewer than 30,000 monarchs were um, reported, and then in 2020, there were fewer than 2,000. So that was really a really severe decline and a call to action, um, and yeah, call to action and then you can see that in 2021, there was quite a rebound in the population. More than 200,000 monarchs were reported. Um, so that was quite, you know, that was hopeful, but it's important to point out that this is still um, a fraction of the monarchs that historically overwintered. So it's still quite a decline in the population when we look at numbers that were reported in the 90s and even in the 80s. Um, monarchs aren't alone in experiencing these threats. There are many other insect, pollinator, and wildlife species across the globe that are suffering se severe declines as well. Um, and these declines have been largely attributed to the loss, degradation, and fragmentation of habitat, among other threats like climate change and pesticide use. In order to you know, bring our monarch population back to a sustainable le level, maintain that migratory phenomenon, there have been some targets set um, to restore the population. In the West, that number is 500,000 butterflies overwintering in California. As a reminder, we had just under, or just over 200,000 this last year. Um, and then in the East, the goal is to um, maintain six hectares of overwintering monarchs through time. And you might be wondering, well, how do we get there? What do we need to do? And so there have been some estimates um, on you know, how we can do that. And in the West, the goal is to restore um, 50,000 new acres of habitat and to restore and protect 50% of the overwintering groves uh, along the California coast. So many of these overwintering sites in California are not officially protected. They range in ownership, you know, public and private. Some are on, you know, in backyards, on private land. Some might be in a park. They really range in their ownership type. Um, and in the east, there, scientists have estimated that we need to add somewhere between 1.3 to 1.6 billion milkweed stems back to the landscape to recover the population. And to do this, we really need all hands on deck. Um, a paper by Thog Martin et al. in 2017 outlined various strategies for recovering Eastern monarchs and putting these milkweed stems back on the landscape and identified that really all sectors, all kinds of people need to contribute or we're never gonna reach our goal um, of revegetating our landscapes. And so that means, you know, thinking about all of the different 
types of spaces we could have habitat, roadsides, urban areas, and so on. Um, a recent study just last year um, conducted an analysis on our progress toward reaching national pollinator goals set by the US government. And they identified that many of these goals or all three of the goals have not yet been reached. So we're really failing to meet goals around um, honeybee, monarch butterfly and pollinator health. And so one of those goals, which I just mentioned on in terms of Eastern monarchs was the six hectares of overwintering butterflies in Mexico. We have not yet reached that threshold and maintained it. Um, and then similarly, there was an, a goal to um, restore 7 million acres of pollinator habitat um, by 2015, and that's not, not yet been achieved. So that means we have a lot of work left to do. And when we're thinking about the, you know, the expansion, the rapid expansion of solar across the US, um, that presents a unique opportunity to perhaps combine, you know, couple pollinator habitat with renewable energy. And so our goal in this study was to understand whether pollinator friendly solar can support plant and pollen plants and pollinators. Mm -hmm and then to identify whether there are impacts of the solar canopies on plant and pollinator communities. So to do this, we monitored four photovoltaic sites in Minnesota um, three times each during the months of June, July, and August in 2021. These sites were located within an hour's drive of the Twin Cities in Anoka, Chisago, and Wright counties. They ranged in size from 18 to 68 acres, and they were all seeded with a native pollinator mix in 2017 or 2018. So it had been a few years since they had been seeded with that pollinator mix by the time I went out and surveyed. We ran a series of transects in two different light treatment types, one being the area directly adjacent to the solar arrays. So they were next to the solar arrays, but not being shaded by the panels. And we called those areas full sun. And then we also monitored um, areas within the solar arrays, solar array rows, those experiencing some shade from the panels throughout the day. And we called those partial shade areas. So full sun and partial shade areas. And then in each of those, we um, collected information about the milkweed and flowering plant communities, um, insect pollinators, as well as monarch eggs and caterpillars. This is just a picture of what one of those transects would look like. We kind of ran them diagonally across these um, solar array rows to capture the full swath of vegetation um, between them. I also wanted to point out that there were um, completed copies of the Minnesota's Habitat Friendly Solar Scorecard um, available for each of the sites we monitored. Um, this is um, a scorecard that measures kind of the planned, um, the planned pollinator habitat and scores them on various things such as the seed mix design, the number of flowering species that are planned to be present in each different season and so on. And all of the sites met and even exceeded the pollinator habitat standards set by Minnesota, re uh, receiving scores of exceptional pollinator habitat. Um, so in terms of our survey protocols, starting with the plants first, um, we use protocols from a program that we run here at the Monarch Joint Venture called the Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program. This is a national program designed to collect um, various information about both monarchs and vegetation. And we ran, this involved, you know, running the series of transects that I just mentioned and placing one square meter quadrats along the transect transects um, spaced at various increments. And this allowed us to measure the richness and abundance or frequency of both milkweed and flowering plants. Um, we also measured the presence and absence of immature monarchs being the monarch eggs and caterpillars, as well as the per plant density, which just means the number of eggs and caterpillars per plant. And this, um, for this, we used integrated monarch monitoring pro program protocols again, and just involved examining milkweed plants that fell within a meter on each side of the transects that we were surveying. Um, we used Argonne National Lab protocols to survey pollinators at the sites. And um, so this involved measuring pollinator abundance by order. So we did not do any collection of the specimens. We didn't do any um, identification to the species level just because of time and capacity in this pilot study. Um, but we conducted two types of surveys for, pollinate, for pollinators. Um, 
One being transect surveys, where we walked the length of a transect and spent about eight minutes um, conducting a really slow walk where we documented all of the pollinators that we observed flying within that space or landing on flowers in that space. And then we spent five minutes per transect um, watching a one meter radius and documenting any of the pollinators that landed on flowers within that radius. So in terms of the flowering plant community, we observed 72 different species in bloom throughout the season across the sites, um, 45 of which were native species. Um, this was an average of 39 species per site across the season um, in bloom, 23 of which were native. And then on a single visit to a site, we observed an average of 23 blooming species, 13 of which were native. Now, when we wanted to look at, you know, the difference in the plant communities in the full sun versus the partial shade areas, those outside of the solar panels and those within, um, we have floral richness on the left, which is just the number of flowering species present at a site and the flowering frequency or the relative abundance on the right hand side here. And so you can see that the floral richness, this graph on the left, was slightly higher in full sun areas, the full sun transect compared to those in partial shade, um, but the difference was not statistically significant. Similarly, there was a higher um, frequency or relative abundance of flowering plants in the full sun transects compared to those in partial shade, but again, the difference was not statistically significant. When we look at the, um, these two metrics across um, the season in the individual months, June, July, and August, you can see that the number of species we observed was higher um, on the full sun transects in both June and July, but the number of flowering species um, was higher in partial shade transects compared to full sun in the later season in August. And then in terms of the abundance, there was a higher frequency of plants on the full sun transects um, in each month of June, July, and August. But again, these differences were not statistically significant. Some of the most common species that we observed across the sites are um, listed here. Those are a mix of um, both native and non-native species, about half were native and half were not. Um, so species like yarrow, horiolisum, daisy fleabane, bird's foot trefoil, black benic, sweet clover, prairie coneflower, black-eyed susan, um, bladder campion, hoary vervain, and golden alexander were the most common that we observed. Um, we observed milkweed at every four, each of the four sites we monitored. Some of them even had more than one species, and those included um, common milkweed, butterfly milkweed, and um, swamp milkweed. There was a higher milkweed density on the full sun transects compared to partial shade, but that difference again was not statistically significant, but the mean density on the full sun transects was about 324 plants per acre compared with 162 plants per acre in um, partial shade. And again, you can see the distribution across those different months. Um, milkweed density was higher on full sun transects in each month of June, July, and August. We observed a total of 644 insect pollinators throughout the season on both the transect and focal surveys combined. And we observed an average of 45 pollinators during our transect sampling and an average of nine during focal surveys on a single site visit. And looking at the distribution on, um, of the various groups, um, native bees made up the largest um, proportion of insect pollinators that we observed at 35%, followed by um, flies at 22%, um, butterflies and moths at 20, wasps at 18%, and then honeybees at 5%. So even though we identified these to order, we did separate um, honeybees, the European honeybee from native bees. Then when we compared these insect pollinators on full sun to partial shade transects, we did find that the number of pollinators on our transect surveys were slight, slightly higher in full sun areas compared with partial shade, but that difference was not statistically significant, and there was really no, um, no difference in the mean on, um, on the focal surveys in each of these two treatment types. 
looking at the distribution in each of the months again, um, on the left, we have the number of um, focal pollinators per visit, which um, were higher in, um, sorry, in June, the number of focal pollinators were higher in partial shade compared with the full sun. And then full sun was slightly higher or was higher in June. And then um, again, the pollinators were higher in partial shade in August. So kind of a mix of, um, there wasn't a clear trend in the focal pollinator abundance in each of these two treatment types. But looking at the transect pollinator abundance, um, that was higher in full sun on each of the visits in June, July, and August. But again, none of these differences were statistically significant. Looking at monarch reprodu reproduction now, um, we found that both the monarch abundance and the per plant density, the number of monarchs per plant, were significantly higher on partial shade transects compared with those in full sun. So 35 of the 38 monarchs that we observed were on milkweeds in partial shade areas, those within the solar array canopies compared with the full sun areas outside. So just three were found on the full sun milkweeds um, outside of the solar array rows. And um, here you can see again that in each of the months, the monarchs, most of the monarchs were found in partial shade compared with full sun. Um, we don't really know why, why this might be happening. This could be due to a variety of factors, such as the temperature um, of the milkweeds in uh, partial shade compared with full sun. We know that um, we had a, a very high, we had very high temperatures in June. We had quite the heat wave in Minnesota in June. So perhaps there was a shading effect and cooler, you know, cooling effect of the milkweeds in partial shade compared with those in full sun. But definitely um, more research would be needed to identify the very factors influencing um, this result. So to sort of summarize this, um, there were no statistical differences in the plant and pollinator communities within and outside of the solar arrays, except for the case of immature monarchs. Um, pollinators seem to use the habitat regardless of panel presence. Um, we observed a high number of flowering species, including some invasives. And there were more monarchs on milkweed within solar arrays compared with those outside of them. I do wanna point out the limitations of this study. We did have a small sample size. We monitored just four sites. We only conducted morning and early afternoon surveys. Um, if we were to repeat this and have more capacity, um, we would do afternoon surveys to capture the you know, variation in pollinator visitation throughout the day. And we found out sort of midway through the study that there were various seed, mac seed mixes planted um, throughout these solar sites. So sometimes there was a different um, seed mix planted within the solar array canopies compared to outside of them. So we might um, incorporate that and alter our study design in the future with that in mind. Um, but I would end with saying that our, these preliminary results indicate that Minnesota solar installations can indeed provide quality monarch breeding habitat, um, foraging resources for a variety of insect pollinators, and they can foster diverse communities of native plants. Um, with many insect and pollinator species in decline, and the fact that we're failing to meet some of these pollinator um, conservation goals, it's really important that we continue to invest in conservation action wherever we can. Um, I'll also emphasize the importance of long-term monitoring to understand the outcomes of pollinator-friendly practices through time, um, especially in, as in terms of aspects that we didn't measure, like uh, soil or water quality, and that management of the habitat will be key. We know that if a site isn't managed through time, um, habitat quality can degrade. Um, and given that we saw a few non-native species, it's important that they be managed to prevent reductions in plant diversity um, through time. So with that, I'd like to thank our funders and collaborators. Um, this was funded by Fresh Energy, and we thank our collaborators, um, Anel Green Power and NG Distributed Solar. And if anybody has questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. And my contact info is also listed here. So I feel free to reach out to me with any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Laura. And I think we're gonna turn things over to Rob Davis now, the communications lead at Connexus Energy. And while he's getting his PowerPoint up, Laura, I wanna compliment you on you're a scientist and a photographer. Those pictures are our next level. So um, they were absolutely beautiful. And I think they really added to the presentation too. Yeah, thanks. It was, I had a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, Rob, we see your screen and yeah, looks like you're ready to take it away. Fantastic. Uh, it's great to be with you, Joe, uh, team at Fresh Energy. Thanks so much for hosting such a great conversation uh, right during, uh, you know, International Bee Day. And uh, certainly uh, here in Minnesota, we've got beautiful cumulo uh, puffy clouds and blue sky in, in the air. So spring is in full swing here in, uh, in the upper Midwest or the Great North as we are, are calling it now, I guess. Uh, Conexus Energy, we uh, affectionately, um, I, I have been referring to us a little bit as possibly the most innovative electric utility you might never have heard of. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit more information. Um, we are a cooperative, so we're organized around cooperative uh, business uh, practices and the business model. We have an eight person uh, governing board with the third largest electric utility uh, in the state of Minnesota, and we provide uh, you know, power to about 320,000 people or roughly 141,000 meters uh, across a, in eight uh, portions of eight counties uh, north of uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul. These, these counties do include two of the fastest growing uh, counties in this state, and so that means we've got a lot of homeowner interest in, uh, in, uh, in building new homes as well as in EVs and uh, in rooftop solar. And um, we have uh, a really humble approach to keeping the lights on. Uh, we won a, uh, a national award for, uh, for grid reliability. Uh, so that is a huge focus, uh, making sure that from all the power generation sources, wholesale and local, uh, we are managing it all and, uh, and really keeping uh, power on so that, that folks can really depend on it and take it for granted. Um, but you know, as you can see from this slide, uh, we've had just growing interest from 2013 to 2016 to 2019 and then 2022 in, uh, in uh, members choosing to invest in rooftop solar and we, we support their, their commitments. We know that you know, there's going to be a lot more electric vehicles, a lot more demand from air conditioning on our system in the future. And so we welcome all investments. Um, as a utility, we have also uh, invested locally and uh, developed five uh, grid scale megawatt class uh, solar projects. Laura had the, the, uh, the opportunity to walk around one of them this uh, summer, which was the Ramsey Solar Plus Storage Project down at the lower end of the screen. But right here in, uh, in, in our service territory, we have about 20 megawatts of grid scale solar uh, and about 15 megawatts of, uh, of utility managed battery storage so that we can fill those batteries up when it's cheapest to and discharge them when uh, wholesale power is at its costliest. And uh, these really help us provide uh, millions of dollars of savings to our members. Um, that said, by having and developing local solar, we know uh, we have an extraordinary opportunity uh, to, to both create more local value as well as protect our brand and reputation um, and so we know that like uh, some, some solar design uh, status quo practices uh, that have been used in, in other places, um, you know, uh, kind of create a lot of conflict. You know, the idea of using uh, productive uh, ag land for solar is contentious in particularly in places uh, like Minnesota and other uh, states around the country uh, where uh, you have folks pushing back on something people say is you know, potentially an industrial use. So um, we're sensitive to that. And we, we know that by embracing our values as a co-op electric utility, uh, we can stack more and more values. So it's really in our interest to ask for uh, projects that help uh, that connect with our, our members' values and help us provide a, a clear and reliable, affordable and reliable electric service to, uh, to our uh, members. Um, so this is our, our very first project on the right. And we were, you know, uh, seeded this back in, in 2014, my predecessor uh, here at, at the co-op, uh, she worked with the team and one of our members, that's Prairie Restorations, uh, up in uh, beautiful Princeton, Minnesota, and they seeded this project that's just out the window here from where I'm at, and um, we're excited for it to be uh, looking like this in the, the next couple of weeks as we get full uh, closer into the summer. Um, we were delighted in doing some research to see that that this uh, project actually leverages a lot of the best practices that have been developed by uh, Eden Renewables and Witchwood uh, Biodiversity in the UK. So there's uh, some tremendous leadership happening in the UK. And I think that we're just uh, looking at what they're doing and saying, how can we adopt these principles, interpret them for our local context 
and bring them to scale uh, and um, and apply them. As 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 Laura mentioned, uh, you know, monarchs are threatened, yes, but also all of the delicious foods that we eat, these apples and blueberries and some of the amazing fruits are already suffering in their yields as a, a lack uh, from a lack of insect pollinators. So uh, if we want to continue to uh, to be able to afford apples and blueberries uh, and not have to pay for human population or human uh, farmers doing this pollination uh, or try to, I don't know, like have drones do it and use more electricity. We just need to keep the pollinators alive and find ways to make sure that we can hit those targets that Laura mentioned in just the last session. Um, it is so important, as, as Laura mentioned, uh, that we look at the entomologists, we look at the scientists, we look uh, at the folks who have domain experience in uh, pollinator protection, whether it's monarchs like Dr. Karen Oberhauser or honeybees and native bees like Dr. Karen um, Marla Spivak, uh, whose TED talk I encourage you all to go watch. Um, but these two uh, fantastic women have been mentors to me in, uh, in, in this process. Um, so uh, Paul Hawken in this Ecology of Commerce book, and I encourage you all to go read it. Uh, it's an oldie but goodie, but there is a phrase that says, surely, surely we can design a system that nourishes and enriches the earth. And this is just, I think, a challenge to all of us, to, to you know, to the folks that are designing and building to say, really, can't we do this? We can, we absolutely can. Um, so this is not rocket science. It's significantly easier to that than that. And, uh, and it, is, uh, it is entirely possible to do. And it's exciting to see that there is actually uh, teams of people working on this from coast to coast. The National Renewable Energy Lab's INSPIRE study led by Jordan Macknick and Heidi Hartman uh, is just a fantastic resource of information. If you haven't read everything that's on the INSPIRE website and or watched every webinar that they've put on, um, I strongly encourage you to do that if you're really um, interested in this space. Um, so the INSPIRE study uh, looks at sites in a variety of different contexts and finds ways to, um, to uh, stack additional functions for conservation or agriculture and really to increase the, uh, the uses and the benefits from this brand new land use in terms of uh, which is happening, which is uh, PV solar. So the National Renewable Energy Lab and DOE, they know that they're are gonna be millions of additional acres. Uh, some say roughly 9 million acres by 2050. And so we really wanna be able to stack, uh, stack functions and benefits into these projects. And they're already seeing some exciting results. And, uh, and so the pollinator habitat, when you establish it, as, as Laura mentioned, uh, that they're seeing increased uh, beneficial insects show up uh, in a variety of different ways. And, uh, and so this is an idea to make sure that we're still treating, you know, what's behind me here as a, a power plant. It is a, a, a managed landscape, but there are ways where we can say, you know, within that context of this managed landscape, how can we close out the stormwater permit and then create additional, uh, additional benefits uh, within that context. So, uh, so Nancy Fund, who's made a lot of money uh, in investing in things like SpaceX and, uh, and Tesla, she, she is a, a strong supporter of public policy. You know, and so I think that that is an exciting opportunity for us to think about when we put that in the context of PV solar and innovation. And so uh, in that context, this is a scorecard that we as an electric utility use because we're not pollinator experts but we want the pollinator experts to say, to look at our projects, to walk around our projects like Laura did and to be like, yeah, okay. This is not like a reestablishment of some pre-colonial condition. There is, this is a solar farm. It's generating clean energy. It's reliable, it's affordable, but it's also doing a variety of things that can help create benefits to pollinators. And so this scorecard uh, that's been vetted by these scientists as well as state agencies uh, is, uh, is, is really valuable and it's something that we use for all of our solar projects. Um, and uh, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. So this is the first project uh, that we did back in 2014, 2015. Uh, this is a photo I took uh, in 2015 when I showed up back then. And then this is on, the, on the, uh, uh, the, the larger project is the Ramsey Renewable Station uh, from just a few years ago. 
Um, and this is, uh, and then uh, this is a little movie from Ramsey Renewal Station, just giving you a sense that like, you know, this isn't Photoshop, this is just, you know, what an early successional bloom looks like when you get up really early in the morning. And so there's the battery storage on the project. There's some of the research that's happening, the PV Smart study in, in partnership with the National Renewable Energy Lab and University of Minnesota that's modeling hydrology based on this, uh, th this research. And then here's some remarks from our CEO uh, about this uh, stacking of functions. We're all trying to figure out how to green the grid. And there's a lot of different solutions. And today we're standing at one. And that is uh, solar energy uh, installed near consumers. But the special thing about this particular field is it incorporates prairie plantings, which gets twice the value from the land. We get the solar energy over the long term, and then the prairie plantings have a variety of other benefits. So that was a video that we produced last last year in partnership with Prairie Restorations. And then just earlier this spring, we had uh, invited a, a local sheep grazer and the Land Institute uh, to, uh, to come and plant some additional uh, vegetation on our headquarters solar project, just one, one acre kind of demonstration project at this point. Um, but these uh, deep rooted plants are called perennial sunflower and they'll be providing all kinds of pow pow powerful pollinator resources late in the season. Uh, and then the sheep are just, you know, a, an exciting practice that we're looking forward to continuing to ask questions about and seeing how we can incorporate more and more of that. Um, these practices are also not just done by an electric cooperative called Conexus, but also uh, some of the world's uh, largest companies like Enel. They actually, from this project, here's uh, Jake and, and Jordan, Jan, uh, Jordan Macknick from NREL. They're actually taking out advertisements uh, in, uh, in online places, you know, showing these uh, these land use practices and helping people understand how do they how they approach solar. Um, we also give credit to Minnesota Power and Dairyland Cooperative for projects that they have in Minnesota and as well as Wisconsin. And then here's MCE Clean Energy uh, about their work on pollinator friendly solar in California. MCE launched Electricity Service in 2010 as California's first community choice program. Since then, we've grown from 8,000 customers in one county to serving over 480,000 customers across four Bay Area counties. As a not-for-profit public agency, we're focused on serving our communities with clean energy and programs that reduce greenhouse gas emissions while providing local benefits. One of the ways we do this is by providing clean energy to our customers through large and small scale renewable energy projects. In 2020, MCE's publicly elected board decided to deepen our community impact by requiring pollinator friendly ground cover for all of the solar energy projects being built for MCE customers. This means that the ground underneath or between rows of solar panels is simply planted with vegetation that attracts and provides habitat for pollinator species like bees, monarchs, butterflies, and birds. Every three years, these projects are checked to make sure they're still providing benefits on a pollinator scorecard. Policies like this are easy to implement and they have a big impact on the ecosystems around us. The future is ours to protect and MCE is grateful to be doing our part. So uh, uh, something that's common that's between MCE and, and Conexus is we're both uh, not-for-profit organizations that are working to provide clean and reliable of electric uh, power to our customers. But also I have to give a lot of credit, uh, Excel Energy earlier this year put out an RFP, excuse me, last year maybe it was, um, put out an RFP for 400, 450 megawatts of, uh, of new solar projects. And they included in that, uh, in that request uh, a, a stipulation that projects meet the Minnesota uh, Pollinator Friendly Solar Scorecard. And that's, that's exactly what happened. You know, there's enough competition in the solar industry today that uh, there are companies that know how to do this and there, and then there's those who don't. So uh, it's never been easier as an electric buyer uh, from a utility perspective or 
uh, universities or corporations to actually just ask that you get increasingly green uh, and, and clean electricity, but also that you, uh, you include in there uh, something about siting and design and management and the stewardship of the land under and around those panels. So uh, in terms of cost, here's what we're finding. So PV Magazine reports that this is, uh, you know, not killing any projects. Uh, you know, when you use a, a, a seed mix that provides an incremental pollinator value, uh, that, uh, that it can be done quite cost effectively. And then this, this report out of the North Carolina Clean Energy Tech Center, you know, highlighted the, how the public is actually investing in these projects. So today's use of federal public dollars is at 26%. Uh, up until the end of 2023, when it then declines down to 22, 22%. So by simply asking for, you know, more than just clean electrons, uh, you're actually helping to maximize the, the, the public benefit. Uh, Connexus has needs, seen no cost impact uh, by asking for these, uh, for these uh, design attributes. Um, and obviously, based on a variety of different factors, you know, whether it's, uh, whether it's context, uh, the amount of rainfall, the soil types that are available, uh, you know, your experience and local experience uh, can vary. Um, but the key for us is that, you know, what we're seeing is that um, our community celebrates these local solar projects. Um, you know, people find technology difficult to relate to, but they understand vegetation and they certainly understand flowers. And so uh, a, a piece of research that, that was put out uh, last year by researcher Alexis Pascaris showed that 81% of respondents in her survey were more likely to support solar if it combined production of energy and agriculture. Um, and with that in mind, we're, we're seeing, again, results more and more from scientists at the National Renewable Energy Lab and their educational and university partners, cooler temps under, micro, under, under, um, under panels, lower O&M costs, variety of different benefits are there uh, when you choose to look at them and count for them. Um, obviously, as well, you see turf grass on the right. You see deep-rooted, uh, biodiverse plants on the uh, on the excuse me, turf grass on the left and biodiverse plants on the right. There's a lot of additional benefits uh, as well, and I think Jake is going to talk about carbon sequestration as well that that comes from some of these designs. Um, there's the NREL PV Smart project, but then I want to also highlight that as a utility, um, that th there's an awesome opportunity for engagement with, you know, with members uh, and customers. So um, we have honeybee hives outside a couple of our solar projects, and we provide that honey to, uh, to local breweries, as well as breweries in other places, uh, to use in their, uh, in their craft creations. Uh, we also have these, you know, delicious, uh, let's see, honey sunbeam sticks that are a hit with the kids and make technology significantly more affordable. And for the, the parents of those kids, we have what I think might be the first brewery uh, uh, utility collaboration, which is uh, that we worked with this brewery called Invictus. They're right here in our service territory. And they put, they put our service territory on their beer and then uh, named the beer after the amount of solar energy available in our 960 square mile service territory. Um, so this is really helping people understand that, you know, that there is an abundant amount of sunshine available and whether people buy our renewable energy credits uh, and become one of our uh, members in our renewable energy club, or they choose to invest in rooftop solar, um, you know, we support their decisions to do both of those things. Um, and it can be uh, really fun and, and, and exciting. Um, and so thank you, you know, uh, we're, we're excited as a utility to, you know, continue to ask for beneficial practices and learn from the scientists as well as the practitioners like uh, Laura and Jake uh, and, uh, and thanks Fresh Energy for, for hosting a great conversation. Thank you, Rob. And um, unfortunately, so many of our guests are not in Minnesota. I don't know. I mean, they're gonna have to make a special trip to get this beer, I think. <laughs> right, We've, we, they, they won't sell out yet. So book your tickets now. Um, all right. Well, I think we are ready to move on to Jake, and it looks like you are sharing your screen. Uh, welcome, Jake Jansky. And your name brings out my Minnesota accent so much. I'm really trying to rein it in here. Um, 
Jake works with Minnesota Native Landscapes, or MNL, and he's the Director of Field Service Operations and a Senior Ecologist, and I think struggling with a little bit of uh, losing his voice today. So we won't be too hard on you, Jake. Thanks a lot, Joe. Yeah, I managed to get through this incredibly long winter unscathed and caught a cold in May now that the sun is out. So lucky me. Um, also lucky you, that means I'll keep it short and sweet and allow um, as much time as I can for questions. Um, I'm, that's a lot of information you've already gotten. I'm gonna pile a little bit more on and then we'll take it from there. Um, so MNL is a ecological service provider and a native seed producer here in Minnesota. And we've been working very closely with the local solar industry since about 2016. Um, to this point, we've restored roughly 5,000 acres of um, pollinator-friendly solar here in Minnesota. Um, we, you know, historically have been a company that does ecosystem restoration, you know, prairies, wetlands, that sort of thing. Um, and we've found that adapting those principles to the solar industry um, has has had some challenges, but it also is a great opportunity to increase the amount of habitat on the landscape. So we've been very involved with um, the development of solar projects here in the state, um, basically from the planning phase all the way through implementation and vegetation establishment. Um, three of the sites in Laura's studies and Laura's study were um, sites that we had seeded and have been managing actively, including with um, sheep grazing. Um, so I think it's just a testament to how, how these two functions can be merged um, successfully. Um, but what I'd like to talk just a little bit about today is kind of that seed mix design and just some of the processes and considerations that need to be, um, need to be dealt with in order to actually create a successful project. Because um, just saying I want pollinator habitat isn't enough to make it happen. There actually has to be a plan in place and there has to be some long term thinking that accompanies that. Um, I think one of the most important things to just be crystal clear about right away is what are the actual site goals? How are those really defined? Um, what are we trying to achieve with the vegetation on the site? Um, is, is the number one function habitat? Um, is it grazing? Is it some other function that is, you know, new, um, new functions are being brought onto the market um, continually? Um, so I think it's just really important to understand what the, you know, landowners, the clients are really looking for. Habitat and grazing aren't like mutually exclusive, um, but there is a big difference between using sheep to manage pollinator habitat versus using a solar facility to feed sheep and develop uh, animal mass. Um, so it's just really important to be clear on that and um, kind of look, look down the road at what your function is going to be. Um, within each site, there's a lot of challenges, um, soil types and hydrology being the um, primary ones, especially here in Minnesota. We have incredibly dry, well-drained soils. We have incredibly wet, heavy soils, everything in between and often on the same site. Um, some of these utility scale sites of 100 acres or more um, can provide a lot of challenges within a single unit. Um, so it's really important to look at your soils closely and make sure you're creating a seed mix really specifically designed for the site you're actually dealing with. Um, tolerance for disturbance is a huge one because, you know, these are industrial power plants. These aren't like these beautiful prairies in the rolling hills and, you know, the middle of nowhere that are generally undisturbed by human um, interference, these are, they take some abuse. And it's important that the species you choose can handle a higher level of um, disturbance than probably most of the, you know, I guess, you know, we're not necessarily just going for the prettiest flowers, um, the most functional, the deepest rooted, um, those that are able to withstand those conditions. Um, germination success, again, easy. You're looking for things that establish rapidly and um, are very easy to get to germinate um, out in the real world. Um, but cost is obviously a big concern and factor for a lot of people. 
Um, native seed mixes actually go down at a much lower rate than your turf grasses. So when you're looking at a cost of a pound of seed, you got to consider that the rate it goes down is much lower. Um, so the cost isn't necessarily prohibitive, um, but what can be is the market availability of certain species. Um, these are perennial crops that we are harvesting seed from. They take years to be able to even produce a seed. Um, so we're trying to project our seed production out as far as we can but when these enormous utility scale projects come on the market, they just consume a massive amount of the available seed out there. And as supply and demand dictates, it makes it hard for some other projects um, who maybe haven't had the foresight um, to you know, be thinking about their seed mix in advance, puts them in a tougher position to find the species they need. Might, even, might make it more expensive or they just might not have the options available and that would make their mix less diverse. Um, so projecting out as far as you can and securing your seed um, even a year in advance, um, lock that down. So when the time comes to do your project, you've got the seed you need. Um, and then there are definitely species you want to avoid. Um, height. Height constraints is a big one on these solar facilities. Um, we don't want species that are going to start shading panels or have um, exceptionally aggressive growth. There are other plant characteristics that... Um, Electrical technicians probably don't want to deal with, you know, thorns, rashes, these kind of things. Um, so we try to take all that into account and develop mixes that are, you know, functional for the purpose of these um, energy generating energy generating locations. Um, all the planning in the world can't um, can't create a successful habitat without actual actions to manage it. You just need a very thoughtful long-term plan um, to get the seed established, to manage it. Like Laura alluded to, there are weeds. These are a lot of industrial or agricultural areas that have a lot of um, field weeds in the vicinity. Ongoing management is absolutely essential and it needs to be part of the plan up front. Um, we have integrated sheep grazing into that plan. Um, we found it very successful in terms of managing habitat in replicating what a prescribed burn would do. Um, obviously our, our clients aren't really excited you know, about the thought of having fire anywhere near these panels, but when we can go in and do some aggressive sheep grazing, really timed and targeted, um, we're able to replicate the positive aspects of a prescribed burn while also providing some um, fire risk mitigation and other benefits to the solar facility. So we have been implementing a grazing program since about 2017. We graze about 2000 acres of um, these kind of sites in Minnesota at this point. Um, we are currently studying the effects of the um, sheep grazing on the species diversity um, of the habitat. We wanna make sure we're not doing anything detrimental to the diversity and the quality of the pollinator habitat. As Rob alluded to, we're also studying carbon sequestration on these same sites, both in the grazed and ungrazed areas. So, you know, maybe next year um, we'll do one of these about those results uh, when we have them. Um, and now the pretty pictures. It works. Um, this actually does work. These are all in Minnesota. These are many of these are sites that Laura's studies were taken on. Um, there is really good diversity, really good healthy plant communities, obviously a lot of good insects. Um, and I, I, think, I think the market is just showing how successful um, habitat friendly solar can be, how both cost effective and good it is for the environment. And m and is just really happy to be a part of it. So with that, I guess we'll turn it over for questions. Thank you, Jake. And um, I think your sheep are extremely photogenic. I, I don't <laughs> think I've seen a picture I don't love. Um, all right, well, thank you. Um, and it's wonderful to do this webinar with you three pros. Um, and I see uh, both Laura and Rob have been at work answering some questions via typing in the Q&A, just because I know we're running up a little close on time. So we're gonna answer questions for the next five minutes, but then maybe anyone who can stay, will do a few more, we'll go a little after time. I'll cut our panelists loose. Guests, you can stay, leave as well, but for those who can stick around, um, we'll dig into a few more. So let's start with the uh, most upvoted question from Hunter. Um, so he, Hunter asks, who is in charge of paying for and installing the pollinator mixes? Is it the landowner, solar installer, state and federal grant, conservation groups? Um, and I think it's kind of a 
like, yes, and anyone. But Rob, do you want to take this one uh, right off the bat? Yeah, as, as a utility or any, any energy buyer, generally the way most solar companies are structured is that they are leasing the land from the landowner or they're buying it outright. And so, uh, so it's usually, in nearly all cases, it's the solar developer who's building the project that is responsible for, uh, for vegetation establishment. Um, so there's, there's uh, generally for just about every state, there's a stormwater permit uh, that has to be be pulled for these projects, and then that stormwater permit has to be be closed out uh, at the end of uh, the construction period. So uh, again, it's the it's the company that's leasing the land that is responsible for the seed mixtures, the install, the management, uh, etc. Over time. Thank you, Rob. Um, and now I want to go to a question from Neil. Neil points out um, because I shared in the chat, the pollinator friendly scorecard map by state. And uh, Neil says that some of the states like don't have scorecards. And I know we have a general scorecard that can be used, um, but Neil asks which which states are, are we actively working on developing scorecards for? And I think it's mostly like state initiatives, um, but Rob, do you wanna, wanna speak to that? And maybe Laura too, you might ha have some insight there. Yeah, I mean, I think all of the, actually not, I don't think, uh, all, all of the state scorecards um, were, you know, were, were implemented with local support and local leadership. And so um, where states, you know, have a strong value for, for pollinators, that's where you've seen a lot of states lean forward and like, you know, throw uh, staff and resources at this. Um, you know, Fresh Energy has been a, a good resource for, for model scorecards that states can start from and, uh, and provide a template uh, based on past experience, you know, if you have a scorecard and it produces, produces results like what Jake showed and what Laura showed, um, then, you know, depending on if your state has roughly the same amount of rain, roughly the same kind of soils, then it might be easier or, or, or more difficult for you to implement something like that. Um, so yeah, so state initiative. So Neil, if there's someone in your state that is a, a lead on pollinator uh, conservation, that is an opportunity for uh, you and your company to to lean forward and say, "Hey, yeah, let's let's uh, let's develop something appropriate for our region." Thanks, Rob. Um, I'm going to go to a pre-submitted question now from Lynn, and Lynn asks, "I think Jake, this will probably be geared toward you. Which native plant companies in the Midwest plant and maintain pollinator plants at solar farms?" Um, well, M and L, um, obviously, no uh, I, I would say most, um, most ecological restoration companies who have been in the industry, uh, prior to pollinator friendly solar have adapted, um, to this market. So any of the local, you know, native seed vendors, um, producers or installers, regardless of where you are, are probably in this field now. I mean, we've seen a lot of transition to, you know, adapting to the solar industry. So regard, you know, depending on where you are, uh, most of your local ecological service providers are probably in this line of work at this point. And m and <laughs> um, Okay, so this question comes from Terry, also pre-submitted. Um, and I know we've been talking a lot about like the industry and business focus here, um, but Terry takes a different angle. Um, Terry says they're looking to help promote uh, using solar fields for pollinator habitat. A bunch of solar is going to go in near their home and they'd like to help make something good happen for pollinators. So this is like a community member. And obviously I think, you know, the first answer I think of is, well, you are like, you have a utility company that you could like exert some pressure on, but there's also like hyper local work that could be done too. And I know Rob, you're, you've been on both sides of, of that table. Um, any, any hot tips? Yeah. You know, it's, I think it's really exciting to, uh, you know, to, to be able to go to a community and say, I strongly support this project. Um, I mean, I think that that just all of a sudden, you know, it really changes the tone um, that uh, that you're not there to block it or stop it or kill it. Um, you, that you you know recognize that like we need to do a lot more of this stuff in order to uh, you know combat the worst effects of 
uh, of, uh, of climate change. And, um, and so, you know, that said, uh, I think that there is a, a tremendous argument to be made about uh, local benefits. And, uh, and so leaning forward, working with, uh, with, you know, local stakeholders to say, you know, let's find a way to, uh, to make more local benefits. Maybe there's a seed company in the state, you know, or seed mixes available and published by, uh, by some, you know, people in the region. Um, and uh, it, it is a really wonderful experience to walk through or even outside the fence of these projects because the solar doesn't make any noise. Uh, I mean, when I took this picture, the hoverflies were so loud. That was the loudest sound I could hear was just all of the hoverflies visiting these black eyed Susans. Um, so, uh, you know, being engaged and, uh, and, and talking about uh, how the, the minor, the, the minuscule cost between, uh, between turf grass and something better uh, can actually pr provide significant community benefits. Thank you, Rob. And Laura, you have been so good at answering a lot of questions uh, via typing that I want to make sure that we hear from you too. So I wonder, was there a theme that you saw in some of the questions you answered? I saw some like before and after type questions. Is there anything you want to talk generally about here to folks who maybe hasn't haven't read through your answered questions? Yeah, I guess I would also say like Rob and Jake, if you you might have also um, input on some of the comments or the questions I answered. So feel free to add, chime in there with your perspectives too. But I think um, one theme that comes up, you know, time after time is the need for more data and long-term monitoring. So we can't really answer certain questions if we don't have the data. So definitely, you know, this was a pilot study. We we observed great, you know, our results were great. We saw, you know, good things in terms of the pollinator and plant communities, but more data are always better. And so the just to plug the importance of long-term monitoring and understanding trends through time and things that, you know, understanding how management is effective or not. So yeah, long-term monitoring is kind of the one theme I would bring up and trying to think of the other ones. I think the other, going back to the scorecard, um, some of the confusion has been around, well, the scorecard is actually or the state scorecards that we were just talking about um, are kind of scoring the planned habitat versus the actual habitat that's on the ground now, which is more of what I was doing of serving what's there versus what was planned. And so um, I think there's a need perhaps for us, you know, some kind of scoring to compare what's on the ground now to what was planned. And there was some question around that. And uh, Rob might know, Robert, Jake, I think there are some, you know, discussion around creating some kind of tool like that. But that was another maybe point of confusion in the chat or, you know, discussion. Yeah, in, in Minnesota, they have a, um, a planned, uh, a, a pre-establishment uh, scorecard and then a post. And I know that for these four projects, the three with Anel and then the one Conexus one, all of them had more than two or three years of growth. So, um, so there was, you know, pre-scorecards and then there were actually published uh, observed, um, you know, uh, established scorecards. Oh, great. Okay. Thanks for that yep. clarification, Rob. That's super helpful. Yep. Are the, do you know if that, is that common among the other states as well, or is that just Minnesota? The, the sort uh, of post-establishment? It, it varies. It okay. Varies. Thank you. Um, and I see a couple questions and comments specifically about water management. And I know we're not really talking about that here today, but I do want to put in a plug for the PV Smart program, which got mentioned a few times across the presentations. So we're going to send a post event email with a link to the recording and a bunch of different resources. Um, but I'll make sure to put in like in the PS or something a, a note about the PV Smart work. We've got some case studies, like the research is available. There will be like a webinar during Stormwater Awareness Week, which is in the fall. I didn't know that, but now I do. <laughs> um, so, so uh, we'll make sure everyone here knows uh, when that's happening, um, but there are resources now. So I'm going to skip the water questions unless any of our panelists have any burning things about water right now. Okay. Um, hey, Joe, yeah. um, I had, I had noticed one question about the mowing and kind mm -hmm. of the impacts on the habitat. And I just, I wanted to touch on that if that's okay. Please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, there's, there's a question about, you know, how, how often is the mowing occurs and is it done in a mosaic 
it, you know, it's everything mode all at once. Um, and I guess, you know, primarily our objective is energy production that, that does have to remain number one on these sites. Um, once these vegetation or plant communities are established, we do what we call a height reduction event once a year. Um, and that's either mowing or grazing. Um, we do acknowledge there are times where we do things that are having a short-term negative impact, impact on um, habitat availability. Um, what we're trying to do is that disturbance event, we're trying to rotate it on a given site at different times of the year. So some years we'll mow a site in April, some in May, some in June, July, August, September, October, November. Uh, we can't mow them all at the same time. Like there's just capacity issues. It's also bad on the plant community development and evolution to do a disturbance at the exact same time every year. Um, but what we do try to do is time it. So um, if we do it mid season, um, when there are things actively blooming, uh, we might not mow it as low. If we graze it, we'll do it for a shorter duration of time. So the response time of the plants is shorter and they're able to come back. Um, we've also developed strip mowing practices, which just mows like a six foot swath at the immediate low end of the panel, but leaves the next six feet of um, planting undisturbed because it's not shading, it's not doing anything bad. So we do try to adapt. Um, we're trying to meet the needs of the energy producer and create the best habitat we can do within those confines. And I think it's important to remember that it is, you know, none of this happens in these settings without the energy production, you know, on a native prairie, you know, out, you know, we work on remnant landscapes, you know, we do different things there. Um, but we are very cognizant of that. And, um, you know, we'll graze a site and it'll be blooming again three days after the sheep leave. And those cat monarch caterpillars are on the milkweed still. Um, they haven't left, they haven't gone anywhere. They're just chewing on the stem, kind of waiting for something to happen. So, um, yeah, I guess that's just kind of the reality of the situation. That's so, that's super helpful context. Thank you, Jake. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about, about soil compaction. Oh, Rob, we're on the same page. I was looking at the soil compaction uh, question too. I mean, I think that touches both on your work. Well, all, all three of you. So Rob, why don't you kick us off? Uh, sorry, let's backtrack to what the question was. <laughs> Scott asks, um, soil compaction that occurs during construction is one of the primary obstacles to the successful establishment of native vegetation or any vegetation. Would the solar farm industry be able to implement practices to limit soil compaction, for example, low tire pressure, tracks, et cetera? So Rob, take it first and we'll we'll pass it around. I, th I think that the 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 key is um, will energy buyers ask for landscapes like this that drive solar developers? to make choices like low pressure tires, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when the customer of the power then expresses a desire for, uh, for conservation paired with clean energy production, then they, uh, they, they happen to award projects to solar companies that, that have the level of sophistication to have those, those kinds of uh, design approaches. So, um, so yes, they're feasible, uh, they're not free, uh, that said, there's a lot of competition in the market and it is valuable that uh, to ensure that soils don't get overly compacted. Um, Jake, Laura, welcome your perspectives. Yeah, I think that's pretty spot on. Um, there are certain decompaction um, activities that can occur post-construction. It's expensive, it's hard to do, especially around a bunch of glass. Um, it's doable. You know, the native plants are good at decompacting soil over long periods of time, allowing water to infiltrate, freeze th thaw cycles, at least in Minnesota here. Um, yeah, it's avoiding doing construction during when the soils are wet. They're most susceptible compaction at that point. Obviously, no one wants to be doing that anyway. So um, that, that's a big thing, but it can be mitigated. But yeah, he, Rob's right. You got to ask for it. People need to know what they're getting into. Thank you, Jake. Laura, did you have any thoughts there? Definitely not an expert on soil <laughs> compaction. So thanks, Robin, Jake, for taking that one. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I think with that, we're at 10 minutes over time. Yeah, you know, Jake has managed to not like have a coughing fit. So I, I don't want to push our luck there. So um, any parting thoughts from our panelists before we sign off 
for the afternoon. I guess okay. I would just like to thank everyone. Um, you know, there is more research going on, a lot of cool things we're trying to look at. Um, hopefully we can bring some more results on, again, habitat quality, um, you know, some of the carbon sequestration stuff, you know, kind of watch this space because there's a lot of cool things going on. Um, but thanks MGV, MJV, sorry. Um, this is a great event and um, looking forward to the next one. Perfect. Yeah, Thank we're, you. We're just delighted to continue to work with great, great partners and, you know, provide more and more benefits for our members. So thank you uh, all. Yeah, and I'll take on that and say, yeah, thanks so much, everybody, for joining us today. Thanks for having us, Joe, and coordinating the webinar. And I think there's huge potential here, and it's exciting to see, you know, how things will grow in the next few years. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Have a great afternoon, and do stay tuned to your inbox for a recording of this webinar. See you later.